Welcome to The Subverse. I'm your host, Susan Matthews. This is a podcast where we journey from the cosmic to the quantum, from the complexity of development to the art of resistance, from colonial histories that haunt us to reimagining futures. In this season of The Subverse, with water as our theme, we have journeyed from oral histories and big dams, mermaids and folklore, environmental histories, to water as kin, human rights and water, lessons and survival from marine mammals, all leading me to one conclusion, which is that water is a gift that keeps on giving. It is in this spirit that we now release our last episode for the season, an interview with Dilip the Kunha, who we are so honored to have as a guest. He's an architect and planner and is currently teaching at Columbia University. He has authored several books, starting with Mississippi Floods, Designing a Shifting Landscape in 2001. In this interview, we spoke about his most recent book, The Invention of Rivers, Alexander's Eye and Ganga's Descent, published in 2019. I really have learned a great deal from his work, his paradigm-altering vision which presses us to see the artificial lines we have drawn that separate land from water, how river civilizations are constructed. The first colonialism that took a wetness which is everywhere and turned it into a land and water binary. This has had lasting consequences on how we design our settlements and create hierarchies between the settled and unsettled. To move to this paradigm of ocean as rain or wetness requires a new imagination, taking gradual steps, learning from indigenous and other communities who have extended and nurtured ways of living with wetness and re-heralding the celebratory event of rain. Dilip, thank you so much for joining us at the Subverse. It's a complete pleasure for us to have you with us. Well, it's my pleasure, Susan. Thank you for having me on. So, Dilip, I wanted to start by asking you about a recent book that you wrote in 2019, The Invention of Rivers, Alexander's Eye and Ganga's Descent. And in this book, you share a premise which I've also seen you share in a lot of your other work, which is about the line that separates land from water which you term as one of the most fundamental and enduring acts in the understanding and design of human habitation. I would love to know more about this line and the separation. I think that's a great way to begin. (laughs) My answer cannot be short, but I will give it a shot. And the invention of rivers is a culmination of work that I began, you know, with Anu, my partner, Anu. I should say Anuradha Mathur. And it calls attention as you say, to the line dividing land from water. But it began, I mean, I would say 25 years ago with the Mississippi, our work on the Mississippi. Over there, I mean, we were questioning the line that was drawn by European settlers when they first came to the Americas. And it was intentionally drawn to create land and contain water to a place. Now, today, the same lines are raised by levees, reinforced by concrete revetments in many parts, protected from pressure, extra pressure with floodways, floodgates, and so on, and then extended by drains, pipes, canals, and I would say a whole system whereby the river reaches everywhere. I mean, it extends to faucets, it extends to toilets, it tends to sinks, you know, to parking lots, to roads. All of these things are now connected by the line of the river. So the line of the river is on edges, gutters, edges, canals. So our whole infrastructure is designed with a river imagination, or let's say with the image of the river, the way we draw the river figures then in the way we design landscape. So that was our point then that we were trying to make that the way we represent landscape is the way we design. So the line really comes into focus 
but it also it's basically about where we draw it and how we draw the line that is what we were thinking about then today we go a little further we ask why do we draw the line at all i mean you got to think about it for a moment what it takes to draw a line to separate land from water i often ask my students can you separate land from water i said just go to a river bank where water is seeping soaking extending where do you draw the line but yet we have been educated to see this line so i mean there are three points that i would like to make when it comes to drawing the line first of all the line is just an amazing invention it's sheer genius that the line as euclid defined it is a breathless length in other words it is all length but no breadth so i can draw it and it vanishes i don't see it because it has no breadth now how many people would think of this now would think of this line or conceive something like this i know that we use the line casually we think that people are standing in line we see trees in line we talk about the edge of a road is a line but that is all cultivated it's a cultivated viewing of place i can guarantee you that there are i mean that indigenous peoples who were not introduced to the line do not necessarily see a line i mean we cannot assume that they do that is point 1 so the line is as sheer genius and the line as invention the second is time when do you draw the line to separate land from water you have to choose a moment when it is not raining or let's say more broadly not precipitating when it is not fogging so that i can see i basically create a fair weather moment now this is not something that is easy to find it is something that i have to constitute a fair weather moment in which to survey or to plot the line because i can't have water going all over the place i have to wait for water to recede to at least tell me that it is somewhere behind the line for me to draw it so i mean it's a remarkable invention this moment of time and this moment of time is one in which we have constructed reality so other moments or let us say rain or a fog or mist or dew or a shower basically happens as a visitation i live in a place where water is contained to rivers to lakes to seas and rain now becomes a visitor it comes and it goes but that is because i choose that moment when water is flowing on the earth's surface or gathering on the earth's surface in which to constitute my reality so i have a reality and now i have ephemerality that's fascinating the third point is the strange outcomes of drawing a line you have flood now flood is taught to us as a natural event i mean i know that there are times in which flood is considered to be man made but when we learned it in school we learned for example that the nile floods and that it flooded naturally how can flood be natural when it crosses a line that we have drawn now this is something that i find absolutely surprising that no one has questioned this no one has questioned this act of drawing the line and constituting flood when they constitute a river they come together flood and river come together so i mean it boggles the mind because what happens then is that you have a flood ecology you have a flood pulse you explain ancient civilizations as i mean whether you see them as despotic or otherwise you see them as controlling flood i mean did these people really see flood i mean did they draw a line and then saw water crossing it and then constituted flood because then you make flood into an event that you can control so you can control the place of water and you can control an event of water so i can predict a hurricane coming i can predict a shower i can predict a flood and this is how we have again rather than question the line that we have drawn 
we have constituted a whole reality around the line to justify it and to make it seem natural. I mean, and I say this with some concern for social justice, because there are people like in India who have inhabited what we tend to call riverbeds. They never saw it as riverbeds. They just saw it as a place that we call sometimes a Maidan, a place that uh, where they inhabited for some time of the year, rain came for some time of the year. You had dyers, you had goats, you had flamingos, you had, I mean, I'm talking about, say, Rajasthan. I mean, you shared this with other creatures, with other actors in the environment. So this notion of the river today is really creating a land use that is now defined as essentially for water and water alone. So even when there's no water, we call a place a river. I find that to be really strange. So there's an agreement here on river. So all of this, I mean, these three points, you know, the invention of the line, the creation of a moment of fair weather to constitute a fair weather landscape, and these strange outcomes. Well, I must add one more, one more strange outcome, and that is the source. I mean, over the last 2,000 years, people have searched, for example, for the source of the Nile, the source of the Ganges, the source of the Mississippi. I mean, you know that rain is falling all over the place. Why would you search for a point where a river begins when you know that it begins everywhere with a wetness? So this comes from drawing the line. Once you draw the line, it has to begin somewhere and it has to end somewhere. So there is a literacy. There is basically a literacy associated with the river, with the sea as well, that comes down to drawing the line. So I draw the line, it is a flow of the river. I take the line to a point where it begins and that is the source of a river. I erase a line and then draw it again and that is flood. Source, course, and flood is a human creation using the line. So that is the basis of the invention of rivers, but also something that we have questioned, Anu and I have questioned for the last for the last 20 years and really developed, I think, as a thesis. Thank you so much, Dilip. And I have to say it's absolutely fascinating. And just to clarify, so in the book, when you refer to Alexander's eye, you are referring to what preceded modern cartography and surveying. Yes, I mean, that is, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say, though, that it preceded. It came with Alexander. So when Alexander comes to what they call India today, to the subcontinent of India in the fourth century BC, I consider him one of the first monarchs who traveled with a world map. It was just before him in the school of Miletus where the world map was invented on the basis of, and I don't want to introduce it just yet because I think it is something more akin to a something that we're sort of developing now, and that is the surface. The idea of the surface and the line were creations of that time. And geography as a discipline came about you know, before Alexander arrives. But he is educated. He's educated by Aristotle into these disciplines, and one of which is geography. So when he comes, he's not really into empire building alone. He's searching for the edge of the earth to draw on the map. I mean, and so if you have to draw on a map, you have to use lines to draw a map. You have to contain water to a place. So I see Alexander traveling with a geographic eye. He's traveling with a geographic eye. And this is a very peculiar eye. It's an otherworldly eye. It's an eye that is positioned high in the sky and looking down at a surface and saying, this is blue and that is brown or green. So you are identifying this or making this separation in order to make sense of place. You've got to ask what was before. 
And what was before was this profuse wetness that he walks into. I mean, this is a supposition that I can explain further at some point. But he needs to constitute land and water in order to colonize. That is the first act of colonization, which is often missed. We often see colonization as the occupation of another person's land or the taking of other people and their land and so on. But you cannot have colonization without the constitution of land. And that is what Alexander was doing. So the map, he was doing it for the sake of the map and for the sake of colonization. So they go together. So I really see geography as the discipline of colonization. Thank you, Dilip. And so Dilip, if I may just ask, because you talked about the line and length and breadth, but what about depth? So if I go into a river or if I go into the sea, the thing that I would think of as a person going into the water is one of depth and one of breathing. So how does this constructed line connect with depth? See, the way we see it in design is by plan and by section. That's how we design. But there is a way by which plan dictates the terms of section. So geography, or let's say the map, is how we identify site. Then you survey the site, and then you discover that it has a topography, and the topography introduces depth. It introduces height. So it becomes an add-on. So the way I look at it, I mean, it's interesting when the way you spoke about water, I mean, you spoke about depth, you spoke about water. You step into water, actually, to see depth. And this is one of our favorite distinctions that we make, that when I approach the sea from land, the sea is beyond land's edge. So land has an edge. But when I come from sea to land, land rises from the depth. Of the curvature of the earth, if I'm coming by boat, it rises from the depth. And it's interesting that when you think about distance on land, you think about you two points that you can measure you can measure the space between, the distance between. But when you're at sea and you cannot fix those points, you realize that space is not of importance. It's about time. And so it's time you know, at sea and space on land. But then it is also about depth in the sea. So the captain of a ship is more concerned about soundings of the depth than they are about length and breadth. And so... It is a measure, to some extent, of water rather than land. But it is secondary when you're on land. It becomes a secondary situation. And we are led by plan more than we are by section. So much of our work has been about elevating the section and allowing it to lead design rather than follow the plan. Wonderful. Thank you, Dilip. And here in the book, so you talk about Alexander's eye and then you talk about Ganga's descent. And I would like to hear more about Ganga's descent and also kind of have it connect with the sort of the items that you've already talked about earlier. So what is Ganga's descent in the book? When we think about Ganges and Ganga, we think of them as synonyms. You know, you think of Ganga as the Sanskrit or the Indian predecessor of Ganges, or you think of Ganges as the English or the Greek twisting of Ganga, the way we look at it is Ganga is rain and Ganges is a river. And what followed after Alexander is the making of the Ganges out of Ganga. So Ganga has been colonized, in other words, to make a river or the rain has been colonized to make a river. You know, if I can step back and talk a bit about, say, Bangalore for a moment. I grew up in Bangalore, as you did, from what I understand. There are no rivers. We had this remarkable gathering of rain in Bangalore in a tank system. Now, they say that it was on a plateau and it's before rains form, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the only point. There is a way to live with rain. I hold rain in reservoirs, but I also hold rain in plants. I hold rain in the soil. I soak rain. Now, 
that way of living is much more a way of living between clouds and aquifers or between high in the atmosphere and low and deep in the earth. That is the way and that's the zone I inhabit. I don't necessarily inhabit a surface that is divided between land and water. You can think about Ganga as this zone of wetness. Ganga doesn't have a geographic place. Ganga is a phenomenon of rain, a depth of rain, a depth of wetness. So when I think of the monsoon, I think of the arrival of Ganga, and I think of her descent from the clouds as rain that does not know a place. Rain falls everywhere. So rain replenishes, Ganga replenishes a wetness, whereas Ganges is this river that begins in points. So when we hear the story of the descent of Ganga that is told today in English, and then, of course, in translations from English into other languages, including Sanskrit, the descent of Ganga is a story told in India and understood as the descent of a goddess in the Himalayas who has been petitioned to come by King Bhagiratha to revive ancestors or to reconstitute the ashes of his ancestors who were killed by a sage whose meditation they intruded upon. I won't go into all the reasonings etc. behind it, but the visual that is presented with this story is of a river descending at a point, say Gangotri, and flowing down from Gangotri, led by Bhagiratha, who some narrators even say made the channel for this river to flow down and end in the sea where Sagar Island is. And so that is the place where she revives Bhagiratha's ancestors. That is one way of looking at it. And of course, it must be said that Ganga hesitated to come down because her fall would ruin the earth. So Shiva took her upon his head and she flowed down the locks of his hair. That's how the story is told. Now, if I had to step back and see, Shiva is a god. His hairs must be infinite. Now, if I think that Ganga came down Shiva's hair and came down each strand of his hair, that is more a picture of rain than it is of a river. We are talking here about an infinite being. And so that descent, the descent of Ganga as rain, is one which is much more, let's say, soft on the ground because it falls in drops. It is not channeled in a stream that is destructive. That is the whole point of Ganga, not falling as in a point, but falling in this field of points. So there is no geography to Ganga as rain. So the descent of Ganga, to some extent, stands in opposition to Alexander's eye. So when I talk about Alexander's eye and Ganga's descent, it is also Alexander's ego of wanting to control the place of Ganga and Ganga's descent as D-I-S-S-E-N-T of resisting his drive. So today, despite her being put in a channel, she floods. She's all over the place. But you can't control her. But that is because she's a goddess. You don't put her between two lines. So I find that to be a much more charming interpretation of the descent of Ganga in opposition to Alexander's eye. Thank you so much, Dilip. I just love the imagery, you know, and I know you've also referred to it as ocean of rain. And it's just lovely also to kind of visualize. I have a question for you about wetness, because this term that you use, and I found it quite interesting that from what I understand that we don't have receptors in our skin that sense wetness. So I wanted to know more about what the concept of wetness is that you refer to and how we could sort of imagine it. Your wetness is not necessarily felt. Wetness is acknowledged. As a designer, we think of the possibilities that when I question rivers as an act of design, I see what is the alternative? What was before the line was drawn? Let me present to you two 
places, two possible places, because you mentioned ocean of wetness or ocean of rain. And I want to distinguish that from a surface, a land water surface. And I take the monsoons as an example. There are two places that follow from the arrival of the monsoon. The first place is rain. When rain arrives, this place receives rain on a surface. Rain gathers on the surface in flows, flows off, flows in rivers to the sea, and then perhaps blows back on the wind to land to start the flow again. That is a hydrologic cycle, but that is a land water understanding of the hydrologic cycle. Now, this is India. This surface is India. We think of India as a ground. It's a subcontinent. It's a tectonic plate. It's land that was colonized, etc. This is India that sort of underlies a culture. It underlies a cuisine. It underlies civilization, a civilization, and so on. It's a land water surface where water has a place. Now, there's another understanding. There's another place that does not receive rain with a surface. In fact, there's no surface. Over here, rain falls into a wetness that extends from clouds to aquifers, from high in the sky to deep in the earth. This field of wetness is replenished by the monsoon, is replenished. So it's a wetness that is already there. It's a wetness that is in plants, it's in animals, it's in soil, it's in the air. You have cloud forests, you have inhabitants of the cloud forests who live in the clouds, as it were. You know, so there is this appreciation of a wetness that is not necessarily water. You see, when I think of water, I've already separated it from land. And when I think of land, I have already separated it from water. So I'm not saying that wetness is not water. Wetness is just the acknowledgement of water in places that you would not think. Water does not come first to the mind. So, for example, a cucumber is 96% water, whereas the sea is just marginally more. The sea is 96.5% water. But you don't think of a cucumber as a water body. You think of the cucumber as a vegetable. So, I don't quench my thirst. With a cucumber, I quench my thirst with drinking water, and now maybe from a plastic water bottle. But there are people who quenched their thirst by biting on a cucumber or a fruit. So this is what I mean by wetness. And when I say wetness is everywhere, I say there's no such thing as dryness. Wetness is a remarkable phenomenon that we have lost because of the way we have constructed the objects of landscape. I love that. And you're right. And I think you have written about sort of the intrinsic moisture in all things, including in our own bodies. I mean, you know, we're 70% water too. And uh, we often forget that. <laughs> that is true. I mean, and in fact, uh, most of the ancients, we think of them as seeing the elements, land, earth, water, air, and fire. They could not have possibly thought in those terms. They thought more in terms of wetness, earthiness, windiness, and heatiness. They thought about these places as these elements as cohabiting. It's not that one excluded the other. They, in fact, included each other, except that when you paid attention to one of them, it sort of took over. It was everywhere. So heatiness is everywhere, wetness is everywhere, windiness is everywhere, and earthiness is everywhere. You know, I mean, you have dust in the air, you have it's dust gives you the particles around which raindrops form. So it is the earth is everywhere. So if you just think about it like that, you know, I would say it's just a different way of understanding reality as cohabiting and as and not necessarily exclusive in terms of exclusive objects. It's true. I think our minds have been so colonized by the lines that it takes a while to kind of shake that off. We'll be back after a break. The more I'm reading your work, I'm questioning sort of my own education and how we study geography and geometry, for example. 
it's absolutely fascinating for me. And I think this leads us uh, well into the next question, which is to talk about city and settlements, because you talked about lines, you talked about surface, how we create these artificial distinctions between land and water and other elements. So in terms of the city and design, one thing that you have written, which I loved, which is that the city today is the guardian and promoter of the settled ground. And this has allowed it to reign over the earth as the quintessential settlement while reducing other modes of habitation to less settled or unsettled. And given my former you know, experience as a human rights lawyer, and I've worked a lot on issues relating to housing and eviction and displacement. So for me, this is, uh, you know, this is a particularly fascinating area. So I'd love to know more. When you think of a river, it is an occupant of land. The city is another occupant of land. So the best way to understand a city, I mean, let's say the first way to understand a city, I mean, even if it is just there, if I think of Bombay, it is there. If I think of Bangalore, it is there and not here. And there meaning that it is in that, on that part of the earth. So it clearly occupies a place. And that act of occupation is driven by an infrastructure where water has a place. So the city compared to a village or compared to, this is the construction of hierarchy, is where water has the clearest place. If I go to a rural area, water is in the fields, there are no clear lines, but in a city, there are clear lines. Water is a place in the gutter. It drains off the road into the gutter and the gutter drains off. So the city is not just a settlement, it is a drained settlement, a well-drained settlement. So this notion of drainage driven by a river imagination, basically the river and the city have colluded to create a dominant mode of habitation. So this is habitation that is driven by the surface. I have a river there, land here. When I started speaking about Bangalore, one of the things that I find most disturbing is that, okay, I'm here growing up in South India, and I go to school, and in school, I learn about how my history is traced to river civilizations in the north, that is the Indus Valley Civilization, the Gangetic Valley Civilization. Those are said to be river civilizations, which I question. I grew up in rain. I did not grow up on a river. I grew up in wetness, in a profuse wetness that gathered in tanks. I played in tanks. I played with this field of wetness. Yes, I was then educated into being a surface occupant. I mean, this is the success of colonization, of the first colonization, the colonization of wetness that precedes the colonization by the British or by or by Alexander himself and others, the political colonization. That first colonization of land, I have to drain somehow, and then I design the river to drain the land and so on, is how we've all been educated. And that is how I've been educated into the city. The city comes from this notion of river civilization, that somehow cities were on rivers. Now, the fascinating thing about Bangalore is the Bangalore I grew up in was in rain, but the Bangalore today, the river has come to Bangalore. The Kaveri has come to Bangalore. So what started off as a rain civilization has been made into a river civilization. So I see the same thing being done and continuing to be done even in the Indus. So the Indus, which I see as Sindhu, again, I don't see it as a river that is there. I see Sindhu as the ocean of wetness, because Sindhu as a word comes from Indu, which is raindrop. So Sindhu is this ocean of rain. India is a geographic surface. When I distinguish these two ways, two places, one is India, the other is Sindhu. One is a place that is surface driven, the other is a place that is wetness driven. 
One is a place that I live in section between clouds and aquifers, Sindhu, whereas the other one, I live on a geographic surface between land and water. So the city is an occupant of the surface driving this paradigm of land and water. So when I say it's a quintessential settlement, it is also the quintessential colonizer. So it uses all methods, whether it is education or administration or uh, infrastructure or religion, they're all grounded in the city and as a colonizing weapon of wetness. So that to me is the city that needs to be deconstructed. And if I may just follow up, so what happens to people who then are not kind of, let's say, typical settlers in the city? They tend to then become kind of excluded. They become ungovernable. And I'd like to just know a little bit more about that. In design, the way we refer to them is informal. They are the informal sector, informal settlement. And I find this word informal one of the most, let's just say, unintellectual terms. Because what it suggests to me is that you don't want to put your mind down to understanding them on their own terms. You can only understand them on a formal that I have defined. And this is what the city does. The city gives you this language, this formal language, by which you then identify everything else as informal. So you don't understand them on their terms. So we see them as bad inhabitants of the surface that really require education, they require infrastructure, they require this, they require that. And I say that we are seeing them wrong. We are seeing ourselves wrong. We should be seeing ourselves now inhabiting the zone between clouds and aquifers and derive another language, another language by which to understand ourselves and these people. We have more in common with them than we think, actually. Because our education has taught us to inhabit a surface that is in trouble today. The surface is in trouble from sea level rise. It's in trouble with, from floods. It's in trouble from storms, from fires. This is all a surface that exists by design. So I look at these people who are uncomfortable in cities, and we have been uncomfortable with them. I mean, the way I see it is most bureaucrats are uncomfortable. In office, they maintain the rules of the city. They step out of the office and they break the rules. We have a street life. We have a street language. We have a language of wetness. And then we have a language of land and water or a language of landscape. I put wetness against landscape. And I look at these people that we just term informal. And he say we have a lot to learn from them. Only if we had removed the surface or the notion of land that has come in the way of our understanding. So we remove that. And that is what our next sequel to Invention of Rivers, Ocean of Rain, is really about. It's about looking at words like gully, like Maidan, like Janapad, you know, all these words that you have in India, or let me say in Sindhu, that we misrepresent as landscapes in India. So I look at India as not a place that was colonized by the British. I look at India as the weapon of colonization by which Sindhu continues to be colonized by our governments, by our education system, by our administration, and so on. Thank you so much, Dilip. And just following up from what you just sort of said, so how can we start shifting to thinking about kind of a landscape of ambiguity, of living between the cloud and the aquifers? And how do we also approach, let's say, our human systems of administration, property, so many legal systems in which all this has been sort of reinforced? And, or even things like disaster management, given sort of sea level rises and the rise in storms. How do we begin to address, let's say, some of these? One of the important things, I mean, I want to say, and I can't emphasize it more, is that Doing away with the line between land and water is not to construct ambiguity. These are ways by which the other has been constituted by the dominant power. So we tend to look at the informal sector, or we tend to see the rural, or we tend to see rain 
as something to demean because there is precision. So rivers have precision, rain does not. Rivers can be predicted, rain is unpredictable. So we have done everything to actually demolish rain. I mean, you just turn on the TV and hear the weather. The moment there's rain, the weather is dull, the skies are gray, the moods are bad. There's a whole world that has been constituted to eradicate the other or to demean the other. And while elevating rivers, while elevating the surface, while elevating land, and all this is now called into question of social justice issues as well as climate change issues. So when I talk about shifting from one paradigm to the other, I'm not talking about something that can happen suddenly. There's got to be a gradual understanding of this new imagination and the shift that we can make. And I don't have all the answers to it, but one good place to begin is in schools and in conversations like this, wherein people are opened to the domination, actually, of, or let's say, the design aspect of the surface. And to say that, okay, let's not fear climate change. Let's not look to just solve our problems. Let's look to how we can institute a new imagination and begin there. So when I look at, say, the way people lived in Egypt at one time, or the way their Native American lived in the Mississippi, you notice the way I say it is they lived in the Mississippi. The Egyptians lived in the Nile. They didn't live on the banks of the Nile. They lived in the Nile. They constructed mounds. So when you construct mounds, you construct a gradient. So it's an agricultural gradient. And if you travel in many parts of Sindhu, you will find that there are people, you know, that you have a first crop and a second crop, depending on the receding of the rain. So that way of inhabiting gradients, slopes, an understanding of, I mean, I hate to use the word relative, but not wet and dry, but more wet and less wet. That sort of understanding constructs ways of inhabiting that have been practiced in so many cultures and that still are practiced. So when you talk about property, property is one measure of land, a land-driven measure by which we have to, you know, we are forced to think about place. But when I start thinking of gradients, I have to invent other ways to inhabit these places. So we have to give up some of these land-centric notions of such as property. And we don't have to go so far back in history. And in fact, we can look at the way certain people live. They don't live by property. I'm convinced, for example, that when Columbus came to America, people talk about him discovering new land. They talk about the conquistadors taking over new land. No, they did not just discover new land. They did not just take over new land. They created the land that they then professed to discover or to conquer. So if you understand that they created the land, then you will begin to look at the Native American differently. How did they live between clouds and aquifers? What were their measures? So it is not so much they did not understand property. They did not understand land to begin with. I mean, now they speak the terms of land because they are forced to speak the terms of land. You know, they're forced to speak the terms of property because they exercise their rights. And I understand that. And we must, we cannot do away with it altogether. But if we have to transition, maybe we can move gradually. And this is what we do in our design projects. We introduce this imagination and we design with the possibility, for example, a flood wall in the short term being a flood wall or a levee or an embankment and in the long term becoming a high ground with a gradient. So it's a matter of how you approach place and allow for this transition of imagine. But first, we need to acknowledge that we're talking about a completely different paradigm. We're talking about a new imagination and a new way of understanding place and design. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dilip. And I mean, I completely agree with you. And I think it's also giving up the space fiction of control and thinking that we can always have everything sort of in order and in place. And what you refer to as property, absolutely. It, it was how people named things. They appropriated it. You know, they put their flags and that's how place became place. I mean, just to one point, if I can make with the idea of control, the notion of controlling 
when you have distinct entities, landscape entities, like a river, like the sea, land, and so on, or a tree, there is a desire to control that is driven with a certain finiteness. Whereas to move to an ocean of rain or an ocean of wetness is not to lose control, but it is to devise ways by which you live with things. You extend yourself. You're not living in a skin encapsulated being. You extend yourself in ways that reach out. You don't draw these lines. And so once you have that, you're not losing control, but you are nurturing and deflecting. And so you're doing things that are smart and can be, from some point of view, as effective as this finite control. And there are so many examples that I can give you from various cultures where this is practiced. It's a beautiful way of inhabiting without that sense. But yes, you have a point there that this control is something that, that we have to, this particular control is something we have to give up, this finite control. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dilip. As you know, this entire season of our podcast has been devoted to water and watery themes. And you are our guest who's sort of rounding it all off. So I really cannot thank you enough. And I mean, for me personally, this year of working with water, working through water has been an amazing one and a very humbling one. I feel sometimes that water is is always sort of, you know, defined in scientific terms as this odorless, tasteless, shapeless liquid. But from whatever I have just researched and learned in this one year is that it is has so many dimensions. And I think now with the work that you're doing and that we've talked about today in terms of the line and thinking from kind of a river literacy, a rain literacy, is something that I think really just helps cap off everything for us. And one thing that I remember that when I started the podcast, I had done this monologue where I had looked at how water first came into to the planet because we were just a rocky orb till we collided with a meteor of ice. And we had this deluge that essentially that brought water to Earth. And when I think about your ocean of rain, I also, I think it now in extraterrestrial terms, <laughs> that is wonderful. Maybe I shouldn't say any more between, you know, between high atmosphere and, and deep earth or clouds and aquas. I should talk about space now. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think we need to go all the way into outer space for this. But for me, it was interesting because when I did the monologue, that first deluge was very important. And I think it fits nicely with this last episode. And the other thing that also really struck me in a lot of my conversations this year was how connected we are to water, also through our own bodies. We are bodies of water. We are connected to other bodies of water. And there is this exchange and interchange between all these bodies. And I think that fits so beautifully also with what you talk about, kind of soak and flood and excess. And our bodies itself, it is a body of excess. <laughs> so again, I love those analogies. You know, I think that's well said. I think the... The idea that the wetness is everywhere, I mean, just demands a resituating of much of what we have learned as history. If I may just bring in Bombay for a moment, since you're talking so much about soaking. And when we did Bombay, it wasn't so much to solve the problem of flood in Bombay. It was also to reconstitute the past of Bombay in an estuary as opposed to an island. So to see it as an estuary to us is to already open it to this depth to the notion of section where wetness increases intensity and decreases intensity or rises and falls. Whereas in an island, you're talking about water here and water there. You drain an island, whereas you soak an estuary. So for us, it was about rethinking the past of Bombay as Mumbai, that we like to say, as Mumbai in an estuary rather than Bombay on an island, which is a colonial enterprise. So when people tell me that Bombay began in a fort, I mean, I say that this is a colonial, this is a colonial history. It began there, it began at the harbor. They're beginning with fixed cities. When I see an estuary and I think that these are these people, they never left any traces because they inhabited, you know, they inhabited a wetness that rose and fell. So they were on beaches, they were in coconut groves. So there was no sense of possession 
it was much more of this openness of openness of, of wetness rather than this closeness of water. So even when you talk about outer space, I mean, I would love to see it as wetness coming in, that it wetted the planet or the earth. But even that I hesitate to describe as an object. I really see this as, you know, about accepting our immersion in wetness. And accepting that immersion is to refrain from objectifying. That is a tree, for example, and we are humans. And I'm sure that most indigenous people did not objectify as we do. The sense of being with a sense of immersion is so different from this transcendent perception and reading that sort of drives our reading or understanding of water as water, as like you say, colorless, formless, whatever that is. I mean, it's a terrible way of looking at water. And we teach our kids this. And I say, I mean, how terrible, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's really making it into H2O. And that is what we shouldn't do. So it's the extreme. <laughs> I agree with you. And I think when you would also talk about that wetness coming in, that's what made the planet habitable. It brought life. It is the proof of life on any planet. So we're lucky that way. There's no such thing as terrestrial. We didn't step out of the ocean. You know, we are still in it. It's true. It's true. I use the term extraterrestrial and immediately there's a problem. You're right because of the term terrestrial. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, but thank you so much, Dilip. And I also want to thank the work of Anuradha Mathur, who you work so closely with. And I'm so sorry to hear of her passing away this year. So when I think of this podcast, I think of her also being with us and being part of this. So thank you to you both for all the amazing work that you've done and for educating us in this way. Uh, truly, truly grateful for it. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. And yes, I mean, this is not just me. This is Anu too. We'll never be parted in the message that we give. Thank you so much, Dilip. And I wish you all the best with all your work. And I hope that we get a chance to meet and talk again. I hope so, Susan. Pleasure talking to you. Thanks to Dilip the Kuna for sharing his thoughts with us. The Subverse is the podcast of Dark and Light a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice, and culture. You can follow us on Instagram at Dark and Light Zine. If you like the show, please tell a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. The Subverse is produced for us by Waka Media. We close the season with this episode and hope to commence our next season in March 2023. Wishing you and yours a joyful end of year. So long and thanks for listening.